the third president of the United States. In a few minutes, you're going to meet him, uh, the third president, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, first, a few words about the scholar behind Mr. Jefferson, Clay Jenkinson. Clay is the nation's leading uh, first, first person interpreter of Thomas Jefferson. He's host of the um, uh, the Jefferson Hour. Many of you hear it on radio. I see some folks from the radio station. We're here, right over there. They're broadcasting locally. And uh, he's the author of several books on um, uh, cultural issues, as well as Jefferson. And he'll be here to sign books at the end, and you can talk to him. Okay. Um, he was one of the most remarkable men of American history. He could tie an artery, survey a field, dance the minuet, read Homer and Plato in the original Greek, built one of the most beautiful houses in the United States. <coughs> he planted a great garden. I actually have a, a winter brown Monticello lettuce in my garden here in Olympia. Um, he basically invented uh, revolutionary plans, communicated with uh, just about everyone, philosophers and thinkers all over the world, skeptics, Baptists, Protestants, Federalists, and Republicans. He wrote the Declaration of Independence, the Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty, the Plan for the Government of the Western Territories, and an important book, Notes on the State of Virginia. Thomas Jefferson, was a revolutionary and a nation builder. Clay Jenkinson says that Friendly Water, Water for the World is one of the leading exponents of Jeffersonian democracy. The program will be in three parts. First, uh, Mr. Jefferson will make a, a relatively brief formal statement. Then you will get to ask questions, all the questions you ever wanted to ask the third president of the United States. <laughs> and he will answer them as Mr. Jefferson. And then finally, he will come out of character and as Clay Jenkinson, answer your questions about Jefferson from his perspective as one of the nation's leading humanities scholars. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. Citizens. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me this deep into the American West. <laughs> As I think you know, I doubled the size of the United States in 183, the Louisiana Purchase, um, without firing a single shot of any sort. No troops were sent into the field. Uh, no mighty armies fought against each other. I purchased the Louisiana Territory from Napoleon for $15.6 million. That was three cents per acre. And in doing so, I doubled the size of our republic. I added 575 million acres to the United States with a single stroke of my pen. <coughs> I bought 828,000 square miles, the greatest land sale in the history of the world. Now, the western boundary of the United States when I became president was the Mississippi River. We were having difficulties on the Mississippi because on the other side of it was either France or Spain, depending upon their own diplomatic exchanges. And whichever nation controlled the west bank of the Mississippi River could control the destiny of that great water artery. That one of the world's great rivers waters the most fertile of all agricultural valleys in the world. And in that time, in the early 19th century, rivers were our roads. If we wanted to get produce to market, it went down the Ohio and then down the Mississippi to New Orleans. We had a very weak surface infrastructure in our time. And so keelboats and bateaux and canoes made their way from one part of this country to the other by water. 
And if Spain or France were in a bad mood, they would close the Mississippi River, and in doing so would strangle our own commerce. And so it was imperative that I do something to keep that river open. And I felt that I had the constitutional right to do it under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution of the United States. And so I sent one of my protégés, James Monroe, a neighbor of mine in Virginia, and a, and a young man I had helped to train in the law. I sent him off to join Robert Livingston in Paris, and the two of them were to try to purchase the village of New Orleans or some other place in the lower Mississippi so that we could station some troops there and some trading houses and keep that river open. I was prepared to spend six million dollars to buy the village of New Orleans. And Napoleon Bonaparte, the dictator of France, said he would not sell us New Orleans for six million dollars, but he would sell us the entire Louisiana territory for 15 million dollars. I was prepared to spend a large amount of tax money on a village, and instead I bought what I called an empire for liberty such as the world has never previously seen. In a sense, that was the making moment of America. Because now our western flank would not be troubled by Spain or France or Russia or Britain. It meant that we had everything all the way up to the Rocky Mountains, everything that was watered in short by the Missouri-Mississippi system. And I knew, as an optimist, that in the long run, we would become a two-ocean continental republic, that, that the land from the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific could not otherwise then become a part of the United States in the long run. And of course, that's precisely what happened. And you live at the edge of it, and you beautifully named it after the greatest American, George Washington. Now, what other state is named after a president? Hmm. I won't. Make it seem as if I feel badly that no state is named after me. <laughs> because I don't. And, and I think that's the first thing I want to say to you today is that, and I know this might be difficult for you to accept, but I never took myself very seriously. I didn't expect that you would remember me. I didn't expect that 200 or more years after my time that I would be regarded as one of the founding fathers with all the, the emotional significance that that bears. If I had never been born, and I actually thought about this in my lifetime, in 1800, I was pushed forward to stand for the presidency, and as you know, I won that election narrowly against my friend John Adams. I didn't want to be the President of the United States. I never would have wanted that office. I, I'm not an ambitious man. I actually regard myself as a farmer, or maybe a scientist, or possibly a man of letters. But I never grew up dreaming of being a, uh, a significant political figure. And I'm not really suited for it. I'm not a great orator. I'm not a warrior. I did not play any significant role in the revolution. I don't have the ambition that it takes to be a, a, a strong political figure, and I'm very thin-skinned, <coughs> easily hurt, easily wounded. I'd rather retreat to Monticello than be in the arena with rough-and-tumble political discourse. So I wasn't really suited to it, and I never really wanted it, and how I became president is an interesting story, but it doesn't involve any ambition. In, in the election of 1800, for example, I never left Monticello. I never campaigned in any way. James Madison was pushing my candidacy, and he, I did not want to stand for the presidency, but we both knew that the Federalists, the party of Hamilton and George Washington and John Adams and Fisher Ames and Timothy Pickering and John Marshall, that party of men had created the government of the United States, and they were extraordinary human beings, really American heroes, but they didn't really believe in democracy. They didn't believe that you, the people, were really up to the challenge of governing them yourselves. They felt that, and this is Hamilton talking, that you, you're childlike, that you're, you don't understand the nature of government, that you should, you should just mind your own business and stay away from it and let 
what he called the rich and the well-born govern you on your behalf. And they were moving towards too strong a central government, a huge national debt, more militarism than I'm comfortable with. Hamilton wanted a nation of manufacturers and banks and commerce and stockbrokers. And I wanted a nation of farmers and small merchants and educators and so on. And so Mr. Madison and I felt that if the Federalists weren't stopped, if they weren't retired, they would take the country down a, a dreary path and we would become just another nation like Britain or France or Portugal or Spain. And what could be worse than to be Americans and follow that path? I mean, think of it. The old world has a long and extraordinary history. The Europeans, especially Englishmen, transplanted themselves from the old world to the new in the 17th and 18th centuries. And when we came here from Europe, we had the chance to leave a number of things behind. Thomas Paine said it in his pamphlet, Common Sense. And Paine was one of the best writers in the whole revolutionary period. And Thomas Paine said, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. And think of that. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. And the sense was that Europe had had its chance, and it hadn't done very well. And now we had transplanted ourselves to this extraordinary new continent, and we had a chance to, in a certain sense, reinvent the human project, only this time to, to use reason as our only oracle, and to, to believe in the goodness of man, and to, and to create small government, and to, and to have more equality than had ever existed on Earth at, in any other government at any time, anywhere. So we had a kind of utopian dreaminess about us, that we were going to do something truly remarkable for humanity. That this was our second chance. And so Hamilton and even George Washington really didn't understand that. They just wanted us to be another nation like England, only with a homegrown government. And they wanted to recreate all of the social structures and political hierarchies and class systems and state churches and mercantilist economic systems that existed in Europe. That seemed to me such a waste of America, don't you think? That we have, we have something unique here. And therefore we have to create a uniquely beautiful and optimistic republic here something unprecedented in the history of the world. There's no European, there's not even an ancient precedent for it. You know, you think of Athenian democracy, but that was tiny little city-states, and it was a very, it wasn't democracy in any meaningful sense. And then you have the Roman Republic at its best, and it was a, a warlike state that fought against everyone all of the time. There's really no precedent for what we were trying to do, but I knew this much. Hamilton, and all of his party, including, I'm sorry to say, George Washington, whom I revered, did not have sufficient imagination or moral courage to try to create this ideal republic. And so Mr. Madison and I felt that if we didn't stop this process, which had been going on since 1787, so 1787 to 1800, the country is becoming more centralized, and Mr. Hamilton believes that war is an important instrument of state. And Mr. Hamilton wants an industrial economy and banks and a national debt and all of this. We felt that if, if this weren't stopped, we would squander the greatest opportunity that humans had ever had since the creation. And so I reluctantly agreed to stand for the presidency, even though I didn't think myself the right sort of person to do that. But I, I wanted Madison to run, but if, if you've ever studied Mr. Madison, you know that he was a tiny little man, and he, was a, and he wore black, and he had no charisma of any sort, and he was kind of a dour pessimist at heart. 
And so he wasn't going to be able to win the affection of the American people. And I was the author of the Declaration of Independence and, and so on and so forth. And so he thought I had a better chance to win the presidency than he did. And I, and I actually think that he was right about that. So I, I said, I, finally, after he pushed and pushed and pushed, I said, I will agree to stand for this office on one condition, that I need make no public appearances of any sort. <laughs> think of that. During the election, I stayed at Monticello and minded my own business. I never made a campaign appearance. I never asked for a campaign contribution. I never asked for a vote. I just stayed home. <laughs> I just stayed home. And the American, so did John Adams, by the way. He, he was a gentleman, too. <laughs> because I, if you had said to me that the path to the presidency requires me to go from town to town and to talk about my strengths and virtues, to boast and to tell you what I will do for you on day one or day 300, I would have said, absolutely not. I won't do it. A gentleman would never do this. It's undignified. And, and I will say this to you, and I hope you take it in the spirit in which I say it. Uh, according to my philosophy, anyone who wants to be your president should be denied it on principle. <laughs> I'm quite serious. But the presidency should be a little bit like jury duty. <laughs> You do it because you believe in the Republic and your community asks you to take on that, that obligation. But I was president for eight years for two terms. I actually think we should have a single term of seven years with a vote of confidence or no confidence in the middle, but certainly no more than two. And when I left office, I would have been reelected to a third term and a fourth. I was, especially after the Louisiana Purchase, a very popular president. But I knew that it was really important for there to be rotation in office, and I was panting to go home almost the whole time. My happiness is Monticello. My happiness is gardening, um, collecting and reading books, enjoying my grandchildren and my beloved daughters, Maria and Martha, corresponding with, with friends around the world in what we call the Republic of Letters, the sort of the collection of like-minded scientific gentlemen who lived in England and France and Portugal and Spain and Italy. Riding my horses, tending my fields. You know, I, I remember in 1800 when I was thinking of standing for the presidency, I made a list of, I wanted to ask myself, why would I deserve this office? What have I done for this country that's of any value that the people should reward me with this highest of, of political offices. And I actually made a list. And, and towards the end of it, I realized that if I had never been born, we wouldn't be that much different. What I, here's, here was my list. I, when I was a very young man, I took up a collection from my neighbors so we could clear the Ravana River of some obstruction. And so I took up a collection, and we did clear it. This was a non-government thing. We just did as a, as a voluntary association of, of men, and we cleared the river so we could get our tobacco and our wheat down to the James and from the James to the Chesapeake. I also introduced several new plant species to this country. The olive, certain types of, of grapevine, uh, a species of upland rice that I, that I found in northern Italy. I was the ambassador to France for five years, and I traveled through Italy and for a very short period in, in through France, and in a very short period in northern Italy, and I brought back this upland grain of rice. And I actually said, the greatest in this list, I said, the greatest service a man can do for his country is to introduce a new plant species into its midst. And I remember reading in Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. He said, he who makes two blades of grass grow where one did previously has done more good than all of the statesmen of history. Huh. And that's in a sense what this friendly waters is doing. That he, he who brings fresh water to a village in Africa has done more good than all of the presidents and dictators and prime ministers of the world because these are, these are the actual practical things that make a difference in the world. But yes, I put in that list that I had written the Declaration of Independence. 
And that's a big deal, as, as you know. When I was ancient, when I was 82 or so years old, I designed my own epitaph. I, I designed my tombstone, which would, would be used in the graveyard in Monticello. It's an obelisk. I'm very fond of the obelisk as a form. And it just says this. Here lies Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, the author of the Virginia Statutes for Religious Liberty, and the founder of the University of Virginia. Those three things. The Declaration of Independence of 1776, the Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty, which was passed in 1786 and was the first bill in the world that separated church and state, and then finally the University of Virginia, which I designed in my retirement years. Those three things, not the presidency, not the vice presidency, not my time as Secretary of State, not my time as the ambassador to France, certainly not my time as the wartime governor of Virginia. I wanted to be remembered, if at all, if you remembered me at all, for those contributions to the freedom of the human spirit. The Declaration of Independence said that every society has a right to govern itself according to its own best interests. And any government which does not serve your interests should be changed as peacefully as possible and as bloodily as required. The Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty says that your mind is utterly free, that if you believe in one God or 20 or none at all, it's none of my business. It doesn't affect me if you believe in 20 gods, or if you're a Catholic or a Jew or a Muslim. These things have no, no effect on me. They don't pick my pocket or break my leg. And so they're none of my business. And the government that tries to get into that zone is violating the most sacred of all principles, that the mind is utterly free. And if the mind is free, all other freedoms will follow. And then finally, to consolidate the revolution, to consolidate these principles of the Enlightenment under which I was so fortunate to live, I wanted to create an academy in the central part of Virginia that could perpetuate reason and science and good sense and Republican political principles. And so I created the University of Virginia. Those three things. I just want to say, couple of words about the West, and I'm going to do something I never did in the whole course of my life. I'm going to conduct a brief presidential news conference. <laughs> and I do so with great trepidation, having seen a few of yours. <laughs> but I will do it and take any question that you might wish to ask me from your time or from mine. But let me say just a few words about the West. I bought the Louisiana Territory, but I never traveled more than 70 miles west of my birthplace. I never crossed the Appalachians. I never saw the interior of the continent. I never saw the Ohio or the Mississippi, certainly not the Missouri. I sent, as you know, my young friend and protege, Meriwether Lewis, out to, to explore the Louisiana Purchase on my behalf. He lived with me in the White House for almost three years before I sent him into the West. I had hired him as my private correspondence secretary, my aide de camp. And because I couldn't do this, I wasn't temperamentally suited to sleep in a tent <laughs> or, or live in the skins of quadrupeds. <laughs> I'm a little too um, much a gentleman for that, I would say. I'm not fitted for the frontier. So I sent Mr. Lewis, who was fitted. He was, from, from almost earliest childhood, he had been a, a rambling sort of young man and go out alone for weeks at a time sometimes in the middle of the winter in, in the Blue Ridge Mountains and come back after 10 days or two weeks, sometimes barefoot, sometimes leaving a trail of blood in the snow. And so I really had the deepest respect for his capacities. And he was familiar with the Indian character and he was had a beautiful, sense of fidelity to the truth. If he, if he observed it in his journals, you could trust it as if you had seen it yourself. And he had undaunted courage. And so I sent him, and I instructed him to, to ascend the Missouri River all the way to its source, wherever that was. No one had ever seen it before. At St. 
Lewis, the rivers, the Missouri is two miles wide, but nobody could tell you where its source was, nobody on earth. And so I instructed him to ascend the Missouri to its source, wherever it might be, and then to cross over the mountain ridge that separated the Missouri from the Columbia. You all, of course, know the Columbia. It marks one of your irrational borders here in Washington. I prefer square states. You know, the eastern border of Washington is Jeffersonian. And the southern border is, I don't know what, but I find it highly objectionable. <laughs> you may think I'm joking, I'm not. If you look to, at the map of the United States, at, at the farther you go west, the square of the states are, Colorado and Wyoming and the Four Corners, that's my work. In 1784, I was on a congressional committee to plan for the Western Territories, and I said, if it were possible, every Western state should be perfectly square <laughs> and identical in size. Because why? Because when we had the Constitutional Convention, and I wasn't at it, I was in Europe at the time, but this was the summer of 1787, my closest friend Mr. Madison was there, and he took verbatim notes. The biggest, they had two giant problems that almost prevented you from having a Constitution. The first of those fundamental problems was slavery, and you know that that problem just bedeviled America throughout my lifetime and far beyond it, the legacy of that in some ways continues to bedevil you in your own time. And the, the convention nearly broke up over the question of slavery on several occasions. And as you, as you know, it finally was able to get past that with a series of compromises, the three-fifths clause and the fugitive slave clause and the postponement of any regulation of the slave trade for 20 years and so on and so forth. So the first issue was slavery and the South was not going to enter into a constitutional system that, that prohibited or, or even foresaw the end of slavery. And the North did not want to be in a system where slavery was somehow <coughs> grandfathered into the constitution of the first free republic in the world. And, and several times they came to an impasse and nearly to blows over this question and finally postponed it that somebody later on will solve this problem. The other issue was the big states versus the little states. And so you have Virginia, at my time the most populous of all the states, the largest geographically. And at the time, Virginia was much bigger than it is in your time. Virginia was all of your Virginia plus West Virginia and really everything to the Mississippi. So Virginia was a gigantic republic. So you have Virginia on the one hand and then Rhode Island. So why should Rhode Island have the same number of electors as Virginia? It's insane. Virginia had a population 100 times that of Rhode Island. But Rhode Island and Delaware and Maryland refused to ratify the Constitution if they weren't treated as equals. They wanted every state to have an equal representation in the Congress of the United States. And Virginia and Pennsylvania and New York said, we, we won't do that because that violates the principle of one man, one vote. Why should tiny little Rhode Island have as much power as Pennsylvania? And this led to another of the impasses, and it nearly broke down the, the Constitutional Convention. As you probably know, if you've studied civics, eventually there's something called the Great Compromise, and you still live with it in your time. Every state has a proportional number of congressmen. The larger the population, the larger the number. But every state has two senators, irrespective of the geographic size of that state and irrespective of its population. So a state in your time, like Wyoming, with about 500,000 people, has two senators, as does California with 30 million people. Think of that. Two for 500,000 or two for 30 million. That compromise was the only way that the Founding Fathers could produce a Constitution. <coughs> the House was more in keeping with Republican political theory. And so, the reason that I, I was on this congressional committee to design Western states, we have the original 13. You see how irrational they are. There's no square border in any of them. And I thought, as we go west, since it's all open territory, we can make these states rational. And I wanted every state to be identical in size, and they would be about the size of Iowa or Ohio, and perfectly square. <coughs> if I didn't really get my way, 
But, as, but that principle began to take effect later on, and so you get Colorado and Wyoming and Four Corners and so on. Imagine if you had done it right, how much happier you would be, how much better governed you would be, how much more rational you would be. I, I sense agreement. <laughs> I'm serious about this. The jealousy between the Carolinas and Rhode Island was gigantic. And we could solve that in the West. Of course, you have to, you have to accept the Pacific shoreline as irrational. <laughs> but in my bill, for the government of the Western Territories, I even had a footnote that said, since the Great Lakes produce so much failure of geometry, <laughs> what if we negotiated with Canada and squared those states off or multiple? You can find that footnote in the bill. So I had a lot of influence on this. Um, more, I wish I'd had more, frankly. Think of how outsized Texas and California are. Imagine how much better they would be if they split into constituent states. Well, those are revolutions for you yet to come. So I sent Lewis out to take a look, and he, he ascended the Missouri River to its source. He found the source on August 11th, 1805. He, he put one foot on either side of it. In his ingenious journals, he says that one of his men, McNeil, he said, McNeil stood with one foot on either side of this little rivulet and thanked his God that he had lived to bestride the mighty and heretofore deemed endless Missouri River. Think of that. Two miles wide at its mouth, and then this little rivulet that he could bestride. What a great moment for humanity. And then he climbed up to the ridge, it's called Lemhi Pass, some of you maybe have been there, and looked down to the Pacific. And he was hoping that there was another really pleasant river on the other side. And what he found was the salmon, followed by the snake. And as you know, those are not pleasant rivers. They're treacherous. And what Mr. Lewis was a, was a very smart man, and so he had done his geometry. And so he had measured the Missouri from its mouth into its source. It was about 3,000 miles. And he knew latitude and longitude. And he knew the longitude of the mouth of the Columbia. And so what he realized was that the distance from the top of the Rocky Mountains to St. Louis was about this wide. But the distance from the top of the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific shore was about this wide. And that means that the river has to go that much faster, farther, quicker down in order to reach the ocean. And that meant it was not going to be navigable. And he found this to his cost. And so they came down the Columbia and they were really recklessly moving down the Columbia, much too fast, but they were in a hurry now. And they got to the Pacific in mid-November of 1805. And then they made a very serious mistake, from the point of view of human comfort, at least. They tried to decide where to winter. And they had really three choices. They could come back up the Columbia, past the Cascade Mountains, so that there would be less rain. Or they could winter on the Washington side of the Columbia, or the Oregon side of the Columbia. And the reason for staying on the shore was they hoped for resupply. They had really run out of almost everything. And I had given Mr. Lewis a universal letter of credit, which he could spend anywhere on Earth for anything that he might need. And they wanted to find a trade ship in the mouth of the Columbia. And if they found one, they would get beads and fish hooks and ammunition and clothing and new shoes. And they were basically destitute by now. And they wanted to resupply, and there, of course, were no places to resupply between St. Louis and the shore of the Pacific, and so they were hoping for a trade ship. And so they, they talked it over with the men and the one woman, this Indian woman named Sakagarwia. And the, the sense was, let's stay on shore and hope for a trade ship. And so they built on the Oregon side, not the Washington side, and they built on the Oregon side because there were more elk there. And they, of course, they, they needed a food supply. And so they built on the Oregon side not up the coast, but within a small distance of the coast. And then they, they kept men down on the coast looking for a trade ship, and none came. It turns out there was one, but they missed it. And imagine how, how disappointed they would have 
felt if they'd known this. Fortunately, they didn't. And so then in March, they stayed on the coast. And if you were out today, particularly in the morning, that's what it was like for four months. Mr. Lewis said during the entire time we were at Fort Clatsop, the sun shone only six times. He said it failed to rain on just 12 days. The men were dressed in buckskins and essentially living outside. They had crude huts. But imagine living outside for four months in this climate. They couldn't get firewood to burn because it was so wet. And, you know, they had, they had wintered in what's now North Dakota. And North Dakota was a brutal winter. It was 20 degrees below zero, 25 degrees. One time it was 43 degrees below zero. But it's dry there. And so if you kill a buffalo in November in North Dakota, it's still frozen solid in May. And so they, the food supply was rich. But if you kill an elk at dawn at Astoria, it's rotten the next morning because of the war. it's too warm here for this. And so they, they were, you can't imagine how miserable they were. And they actually said they preferred Dakota to the mouth of the Columbia. And so because they, they disliked it, you know, Lewis made a famous journal entry on the first day of January 186, and he said, he said, our repast of this day consisted essentially of spoiled elk and wapato root, a kind of a swamp potato. And he said, our only beverage was pure water. He said, the only thing that made this day acceptable was our anticipation of the first day of January next year, when we'll be back in civilization. And so they left early. They left on the 23rd of March, 1886, before really the weather was right for it. And they got stuck. They got stuck in the Rocky, Rocky Mountains because the snow cover was so thick. He finally got back to St. Louis on September 23rd, 1886, and he stopped the mails and sent me a report. And, and, and the only thing that you need to know about the report is this. Mr. Lewis said, if you had, to me, he said, Mr. Jefferson, if you had any illusion that there was an all-water passage across the continent, you must give that up. <laughs> I had said to him, because I'm a bit of an optimist, I suppose, I had said to him that I hope that the portage between navigable waters of the Missouri and navigable waters of the Columbia would be a half a day. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out it was something like six weeks. And over 100 40 miles of which eternal snow, and 300 miles of rugged mountains. And so if rivers are our highways and you could get a boat close to the source of the Missouri, you can't just take it out and put it in the next river. It's, it's a very, very long portage. And so this effectively ended once and for all the ancient dream of a Northwest Passage. You know, from the moment that Europeans discovered the New World, they had hoped that there might be a water passage above the continent or through it. And Mr. Lewis effectively put that ancient um, idea to rest. He said that we would have to station horses on either side of the mountains and have friendly Indians to serve as farriers. And he said, this was the, whatever trade we might want to do with the China or with the Pacific coast will have to be small items that are not perishable. And so thus ends the, the Northwest Passage. And he also said a couple of other things that I should tell you in closing. He said, he said, the native peoples are on the whole friendly. He met more than 50 different tribes. He said, they're on the whole very friendly, and they listen very respectfully to what we have to say. But he said, they don't really seem to believe that we can bring the trade goods that we say we can bring. And they're so addicted to warfare, skirmishing with each other, horse stealing and skirmishing. He said that they didn't really hearken to our peace speech. So that was disappointing to him, that the native peoples were more set in their tribal nomadism and warfare than we had hoped. I had hoped that if we just said peace is preferable, that the native peoples would hearken to us, but they, they really didn't so much. And he said that the Great Plains were so treeless and so windswept 
that it wasn't clear that they could ever be settled. He said, this is really an inhospitable <coughs> environment, he said. He said the Willamette Valley would be a beautiful place for settlement. And on this side of the Cascades, yes, but from the Cascades to the Bitterroot Mountains and from the Bitterroot Mountains to roughly Iowa, he saw as a kind of a great American desert and wondered how we would ever settle it. So its trees were the very basis of our houses and our fences and our barns and our fuel. So his results, he came back in 186. He wrote a prospectus and said that there would be a three-volume account of his famous travels. I was very much interested in that report. When he first got back, we actually got down on the floor in the White House and he spread out his maps and journals and we talked about his discoveries. He discovered 172 new plant species and he discovered 144 new animal species. And then, as I say, met more than 50 tribes. He took down vocabularies and their ethnographies and their belief systems to the extent that he could understand them. So I was waiting for his three-volume report. The story ends. Sadly, Mr. Lewis took his own life uh, just three years after returning. He was 35 years old, and he, on the Natchez Trace near Nashville, Tennessee, he, he put a gun to his head and took his life, and in doing so, it was a loss to me personally. He was like a son to me, but it was a loss to this country because imagine what was in his head that he would have written had he lived to finish his book. He never wrote a single page, so far as we know, of his book. And so the Lewis and Clark Expedition is a, is a huge national story. As you know, it has a slightly disappointing feel to it to me because the, the report, the publication project, was equally important as the, the adventure itself. In fact, the adventure was really just the basis for the report that would follow. So I think I'll stop there and see what questions are on your mind on any subject whatsoever. So who would like to ask the first question? Here's one. You edited the Bible. What did you take out and why? And did you put it together? Did you have to in? So the question is, did I edit the Bible? And if so, what did I remove? On what basis? And did I add anything? You know, I'm sorry you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> because I, made, I did do this. But it was very, very private. Because I know people feel strongly about this. And I, I'm certain that I'm going to offend some of you in, in answering this question. I will, because it's a historical evening. But in my own lifetime, I would have said, look at the time, <laughs> I would have found an excuse to leave. I'm serious. I would never have talked about this. So let me try to talk about it in the, in the most, in the briefest and most honest sort of way. I was thinking about this backstage. I was born in Virginia in 1743. And I grew up on a plantation. My parents were Anglicans. They were good Church of England people. But then I started to read. I, I was fortunate. I had a mentor named William Small, who was part of the Scottish Enlightenment. And he was the most brilliant professor at the College of William and Mary. And he was a bachelor living in the New World. He was from the Old World. And, and he took me as his friend and his favorite student. And he put books in my hands, books of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was a European movement that began in France and in Scotland. But it, the principle of the Enlightenment was that there, is no, there are no sacred ideas. There are no received truths that we shouldn't reinvestigate. Diderot in his famous encyclopedia said, everything must be rethought. Everything must be reexamined with a single eye to reason and good sense and skepticism. And there are no sacred truths. Everything is, is fair game to examine. And so I examined the received tradition in Christianity as it was provided to me under the Anglican dispensation. And over a period of time, I realized I didn't believe all of it. Now, I mean no disrespect to anyone in this room, believe me. But I don't think that the Trinity can possibly be true. Three is one, one is three. I just don't see that the Trinity can be true. I don't think a five-year-old could understand it. I don't think a 75-year-old can understand it. 
We're either monotheistic or we aren't. And so I rejected the Trinity. I rejected the miracles of walking on water and turning water into wine and raising Lazarus, particularly raising Lazarus from the dead. That doesn't seem possible. And then I even rejected the divinity of Jesus. I believe that Jesus was maybe the greatest human being who ever lived, certainly the greatest ethicist. But whether he was the son of God born in the womb of a virgin, I have deep doubts about this. It seemed to me that he was born in obscurity and that he rose by the sheer capacity of his brilliance and his ethical insights, that he became a, a Jewish rabbi and radical in some respects. He was radicalizing Judaism. This got him into uh, trouble with the Jewish authorities and with the Roman colonial authorities, and they crucified him, which was a humiliating way to crucify common cutthroats and so on. And that after he was brought down from the cross, he was buried, and for one reason or another, the body either disappeared from the tomb or was said to have disappeared from the tomb, and a cult of this sprang up. Now, I'm certain, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm certain I have offended people by saying this. That's why I didn't want to talk about it. So when I was president of the United States, my friend Joseph Priestley, the father of the Unitarian Church, and by the way, the discoverer of oxygen, he wrote to me and said, Mr. Jefferson, since you believe these things, why don't you codify them? Why don't you write them down? So I decided to do it, and I bought two identical copies of the New Testament. I discarded the Old Testament as not worth a moment's human attention. <laughs> and of the New Testament, I bought two copies so I could use a razor, and I cut out and pasted into a book the passages that I thought were an authentic biography of Jesus, and then what I called his, his most likely sayings. I don't think everything in the New Testament that is said to be said by Jesus was said by him. There are interpolations, there are failures of transmission of texts, so different people later wedge things in for their own political or doctrinal purposes. If you took all the sayings of Jesus out of the New Testament and lined them up, I could go through them and say, I think that one's more likely than that one, and I think that one's more authentic than that one. And I said to John Adams, it's, it's easy to find the authentic sayings of Jesus in the New Testament, it is to find diamonds in a dunghill. Hmm. And so I pasted all this together, a brief biographical sketch of Jesus, and then what I called some of his more clear-headed sayings. I removed the miracles, I removed the apocalyptic matter, I removed most of the healings, although not all of the healings, and I removed all of the metaphysics, the last days, the end times, and so on. And that produced a pamphlet of 42 pages I did not publish this. I was not a fool. <laughs> and if I had published this, this would have been the end of my usefulness to the American people. So I kept it as a purely private devotion. John Adams asked to see it. I reluctantly sent him a copy of it and insisted that he send it back by the next post and not take an extract. I didn't mean for this to be blasphemous. I didn't add anything. It was just a private meditation to see if I could, this has been going on ever since, by the way. I was one of the first to do this. It's been going on up till your own day. People trying to discern the historical Jesus and the authentic sayings. There are whole teams of scholars that work on this every day of the year in your time. And so that was that. That's called the Jefferson Bible. And then I also produced, later in my retirement, I produced a polyglot version of the same with five different languages in parallel columns, Greek and Hebrew and Latin and so on. This, is, this was just a private matter. Then in the 1870s, the Congress of the United States discovered this in my papers, and they published it as the Jefferson Bible. I would never have permitted its publication, because that gives it a, a sense of authority that it simply doesn't have. I don't pretend that I am worthy of editing God, as it were. So how many of you had never heard this story before? And how many of you respect me less now? 
Well, that's good. You're, you're all Jeffersonians, or, or possibly cowards. Yeah. Anyway, that's the story of the Jefferson Bible. Other questions? Yes, over here, sir. How much were you uh, thinking about countering the uh, economic and political ambitions of England when you commissioned the expedition of the Southern? Yeah, so how about, did the Lewis Clark expedition and others like it have anything to do with, with our economic struggles with England? Well, that's a good question. So first of all, let me say that I'm an agrarian. I think the ideal American is a farmer who feeds and clothes himself and shelters himself. I said the ideal American is a farmer who works modestly hard in his fields by day and at night reads Homer in the original Greek. <laughs> that seems to me the American dream, um, truly. And it goes back to Horace, the Roman poet, and goes back to Virgil, the Roman epic poet, and then to Homer. But I believe this kind of agrarian, poetic lifestyle is the ideal one, because a farmer doesn't owe anyone anything. If the, if the Constitution broke or the economy collapsed, the farmer can feed himself and clothe himself and so on. And so farmers make the most the best citizens in, in any country, I believe. So I'm an agrarian to the, to the core. But I knew that there was a decided genius among the American people for trade, in the, especially in New England, that the American people wanted to trade with the world. And so I always believed that a statesman like myself should acquiesce into the decided will of the people. And since they wanted to trade, we had to accommodate that. And one way for us to gain greater independence from Britain was the fur trade. So we won the war, as you know, the Peace Treaty of 1783 gave us our independence, but we didn't really become independent of Britain because they still controlled almost everything. They controlled our language, they controlled our literature, they controlled the world's sea lanes. We had a pitiful navy, if any. And they also set the, the market rates for our tobacco and for other products like um, naval stores, and, tar and canvas and ropes and so on. And so we were still economically colonized by Britain, even though we were technically politically free. And I wanted to end that. And the best way to do it was to turn inward, you know, not to trade at all. The American people weren't going to do that. But if we could get into the fur trade, we could not only prosper, but we could wrest the fur trade away from the British. The British controlled it. The British came down from Montreal and from Hudson's Bay, and they controlled the vast interior, including what's now Wyoming and Idaho and Washington and Oregon and the Dakotas and so on. And so I wanted to remove them from the scene altogether, and the best way to do it was for us to, to compete against them. And so Lewis and Clark were on a mission to see about that. And under the Jay Treaty of 1795, the British were still permitted to be in the United States to trade with Indians, but they couldn't badmouth us and they couldn't try to edge us out and they couldn't try to form Indian confederacies against our interests. But they were doing precisely that. And so Lewis, when he got to what's now North Dakota, built Fort Mandan, and there were these British traders from Hudson's Bay and from Montreal there, and he put them on warning and said, you know, you can continue to be here, but you cannot give out sovereignty tokens, you cannot undermine the purposes of the United States, and if we find that you're doing those things, we will expel you. So we were trying to do this, and what Mr. Lewis found in his journey was that there were, were an infinite number of, of beaver, that the whole West in the United States was just a, a, a profound hmm. beaver zone, and that we could, we could get that trade. And so even as Lewis and Clark were coming down the river in 1806, and from what's now North Dakota to St. Charles, they saw more than 150 individuals already going up the river before they even got back, bent on the fur trade. And one of their men, a man named John Coulter, actually asked Lewis Clark if he could go back. He didn't, he didn't make it all the way to St. Louis. He wanted to get involved in that great economic enterprise from the start. And so this was a very, this was good. And I, I actually wrote letters to John Jacob Astor, trying to form a partnership with him to create an American fur trade. And, and this has another purpose. I, I won't go into great detail, but you know, it's one thing for us to prosper and to get more independent of England. But it's also the case that Indians were locked in a kind of a Stone Age world. And we wanted to bring them up to a higher level of civilization if we could. 
And the way to do this is to begin with commerce. Now this, this goes back to the Scottish Enlightenment thinker David Hume who said commerce is the great civilizing force. When nations are trading things, they stay at peace and they work out their differences and they have cultural exchanges and they learn each other's languages and they create um, you know, protocols of the exchange of monies and so on and that this is the way to create peace in the world. And so I thought if we had, if we had intercourse with the Indians by way of this fur trade and we were taking to them kettles and awls and needles and hatchets and other things that they couldn't produce for themselves, and they were giving us what they had in abundance, this rich fur, that everybody would benefit and that this would help to bring them along into a higher level of, of civilization. And so I was eager to do it for, for that purpose also. Other questions? Yes? Three questions there. One is, will I speak a little bit about slavery? The second one is about a woman named Sally Hemings, and and the third is about the legacy of the future in your time. Let me say first of all that I was myself a slaveholder. I bought and sold slaves in the course of my life. I own several hundred slaves. I wasn't one of the largest slaveholders in Virginia by any means, but I wasn't certainly one of the smallest. The average farmer in Virginia had two or few or fewer slaves. It has to seem to you just a fundamental hypocrisy that I could say all men are created equal and then buy and sell them too. And I don't think that there's anything that I can possibly say that will exonerate me from this. That's just a simple irresolvable paradox that I'm the author of the Declaration of Independence and I was a slave master. I freed eight slaves in the course of my life, three during my lifetime and five at the time of my death in 1826. That's not many. And they all were freed because they had special skills or they were mulattoes. I once said it's like having the wolf by the ears. You can't hang on and you can't let go. Hmm. You can't hang on because you know it's an abomination morally, economically highly inefficient, a fundamental violation of human right, a, 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 a profound shattering of our own dream of ourselves as a free and freedom-loving people. And you can't let go because, first of all, where would these freed slaves go? It was illegal in Virginia for any freed slave to stay within the boundaries of the state. I, I felt, I know this will sound appalling perhaps, but I felt that slaves were actually better off at Monticello under benign supervision than if I loosed them into a world where they had no rights and no prospects. I'm a paternalist in that regard. Of course, to say that, to say that I know better what's best for them is, of course, appalling. I tried to free all the slaves of this country. I proposed a dozen different pieces of legislation. My first bill in Virginia was one that would have allowed slaveholders to manumit their slaves under control conditions, overwhelmingly defeated. Uh, I wrote several draft constitutions for Virginia in which all slaves would be freed. In 1800, any slave born after 1800 would be born free, a black person. Um, finally, in 1808, I had some success. As I said earlier, the Constitution postponed by 20 years any regulation of the slave trade. And that, that anniversary came during my second term, and I urged Congress to outlaw the slave trade, and Congress did. But this was too little and too late. So I worked hard at it. I'm not complacent about this. I don't think slavery is, uh, is, a, is a good. I don't think it can be justified in the Bible. I don't think it can be justified in natural law. It can't be justified in the human heart. It's just one of those things. 
And to get out from under it is a lot harder than to get into it. And I found that my fellow Virginians were not eager to talk about this, and in fact they, they made it clear to me that they would punish me if I continued to push for emancipation. And so that's a short answer to your question. That I could give a much, much longer one. I, I simply have to plead guilty to this. I can't, I can't justify my life. I knew this would be a blot upon my reputation, and, and it is. As to Sally Hemings, that certainly is none of your business. <laughs> As to the future, you know, the future, so in, in Notes on Virginia, my only book, I wrote about this, and I urge you to take a look at it. I said, because slavery was the founding connection between the two peoples, and no other, you know, we met in slavery, master and slave, I said, even if we free all the slaves, this doesn't go away because there will always be a legacy. There will be resentment from the former slaves, of course. Why wouldn't they resent us? And we will fear them because they must feel principles of anger and even vengeance towards us. And so I said that the legacy of this will be hundreds of years maybe, maybe forever, that this poison in the, in the center of our republic will continue to actuate because in, in Rome and in Greece there was slavery, of course, but the slaves were not people of color. The slaves were just slaves. It could be one out of three of you could be a slave in this room. And then when they were finally emancipated, they just mingled in. But the badge of slavery in this country is to be black. And so when we emancipate, that badge will continue and it will be a reminder to everybody and it will unsettle the harmony of the country. And so you're seeing it. I would have thought by now, you know, several hundred years after my time, that it would have ceased to bedevil American life. But as you all know, it, does, it has not ceased to bedevil American life. And so this is something that we in my era are partly responsible for, but frankly, it's something that you all are partly responsible for, too. I would just say this, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry that we're even talking about this, but of course, it's essential that we do. I believe that I had very grave doubts about whether we could be a biracial republic. I thought, let's just say we could build the support to free all the slaves, which we couldn't in my time. I believe that they will have to be offered a homeland in the West or an island in the Caribbean or repatriated in their native Africa, but I, I did not have any optimism about the possibility of a biracial republic given that the founding relationship was one of master and slave. And so I was a pessimist on that score. Uh, and towards the end of my life, I realized that a civil war was coming, the Missouri Compromise of 1818, 1819, and 1820 created a sectional divide between North and South, and it was clear to me that we were moving towards a breakdown of our constitutional system. And I couldn't think of anything that would be a deeper shame, a deeper nightmare, than that our republic collapsed into a civil war. And as you know, that's precisely what happened. I was dead, thank goodness, because what a tragedy for a, an optimistic republic like ours to, to fall into that. So I, I hope that is at least a start of an answer. Yes, sir. Um, what did you uh, think, or what was your attitude towards uh, gun ownership and the role of uh, Texas? My attitude towards gun ownership? Oh, this, let me just say, this will be my last news conference. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you would ask about wine, and my favorite classical books, or architecture, or the curriculum at the University of Virginia, or... <laughs> paleontology or <laughs> library classification or foundations of the Library of Congress. Uh, but no, it's Sally Hemings and <laughs> guns. <laughs> I believe that I was not one of the founding fathers who crafted the Constitution. I was in Europe at the time. I was, in a sense, the midwife to the Bill of Rights. To, it, I won't go into detail, but the Constitution makers, 55 of them, met in Philadelphia. And they finished their work in September of 1787, and there was no Bill of Rights. 
there had been a secrecy rule, so I hadn't seen the process, and then suddenly I got three copies. I was in Europe, I got one from Dr. Franklin, my, my hero, and I got one from George Washington, the most important American, and another from James Madison, the father of the Constitution. And so I was so looking forward to reading this, and I opened these packets, and I read the new Constitution, and I was appalled that it didn't have a Bill of Rights. This is the age of the rights of man. This is the Enlightenment, the first age in human history that understood that humans are born with rights. Rights aren't given to you by government. You're born with them. And so I wrote the, one of the few angry letters of my life. I was almost never angry. I wrote an angry letter to Mr. Madison. I said, what every people on earth has a right to expect against its government is a Bill of Rights. This can never be left to inference. It's not implied in this or any other constitution. It must be spelled out in plain English in any constitution that does not contain a charter of the rights of man is under natural law null and void. I wasn't alone in this. The majority of the American people were equally concerned. And so Mr. Madison finally agreed to, to create a Bill of Rights. He gathered almost 200 proposed amendments. He whittled that down to 18. Congress debated them. First Congress of the United States, 12 were promulgated and 10 were ratified on the 15th of December, 1791. So that became the Bill of Rights. I said, now let's corkscrew them into the main body so it's not some sort of an afterthought in history. Now, the Bill of Rights that you have, and the Second Amendment is the one that you're pointing to, these are, these are rights of man so important that they are sequestered, that, they, that the Founding Fathers went out of their way to say these are so important that they, they have constitutional strength, free speech, immunity from self-incrimination. We can't be subjected to cruel and unusual punishments. We have a right to a trial by jury. We have a right to, to freedom of expression and, and, and to, to protest in the streets if we think that our government is wrong. These are fundamental rights of man. And the second is the right to keep and bear arms. And I will just say this. I think you have the right to keep and bear arms because you have the right to protect your home from invasion. You have the right to keep and bear arms in case you need to bring down your government from time to time. The right to revolution is a sacred human right. Government must never have a monopoly on the uses of force, ever. The people have to have the wherewithal to bring down their government. And so I support the Second Amendment. I believe a free man is a man with a gun. Having said that, and I also want to say, as I, as I think I alluded to, that the Constitution is so adamant about this that if you don't like this, you have to write a counter amendment. You can't do this through routine legislation. Let's say all of you want to restrain gun use, then you have to have a counter amendment because the Second Amendment is that firm. Routine legislation should not be permitted on a question of this sort any more than on a question of free speech. However, let me just say this much, a high tech weapon in my time was a musket that took 40 seconds to reload. Keep that in mind. Technologies matter, don't they? Yeah. But you must, you must factor in technology just as you do on free speech. Free speech in my time didn't mean whatever it is you do with those screens. <laughs> the technologies change the equation. The fundaments are there, but, but you must factor in the technologies of, 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 the, of your time in thinking about these things. And so imagine one of your, imagine what happened in your Las Vegas. Which, by the way, that's not a very Jeffersonian place. <laughs> a, a, a place utterly given over to human vice. In America. You know, no plant has ever been grown there, or none, none that one can eat. <laughs> and so you have several score of people killed. In my time, that gunman would have gotten off one or two or three shots at most with a musket. And so you, you certainly have to at least have a national conversation about technology, because all of you will say, if we went around the room and I said, name the weapon that should be outlawed under the Second Amendment, you would all have one. It might be a, a tank or a cruise missile, but you all will draw a line somewhere and say that's the limit of someone's right to keep and bear arms. Technologies matter. So I go back to what I originally said. A free man is a man with a gun. The Second Amendment is a kind of an absolute. That doesn't mean you don't talk about it 
and make rational discussions about mayhem when order is the first business of any society. So I believe I've come down on every side of that issue. <laughs> and therefore, I'm a politician in your time, too. I'll take a couple more questions. Madam. Freedom of association. I'm not quite sure what you mean by it, but it seems to me that if you're free, you can associate with any human being that you please. Um, there should be no prohibitions on this of any sort. Uh, what are you pointing to? Uh, well, there are uh, some people who are not allowed to have friends with other people. Let, let me put it this way um, about association. In a state of nature, I always like to talk about this in kind of a fundamental way. In a state of nature, if there's no government of any sort, if you just live, if you all, let's say that this is the whole population of America, and you're dispersed across the landscape, and you're living in a state of nature, no government of any sort, then you have absolute freedom. You can choose the people you want to associate with, and if you don't want to associate with people, you're fine. We want to be left alone, and we're Americans. Our code is to be left alone to the maximum extent possible by government. The government is not the right tool to adjust our social relations. Government does some things. It protects our coasts and harbors. It delivers the mail. It settles a dispute between Maryland and Virginia. But government does not regulate us except in those few areas that we have granted to government the right to regulate. We have a right to be left alone. If I earn $1,000 a year, I have a right to that money. And only if I have agreed that government can take some of that out of my pocket by way of tax is that possible. So government should only do those things that we have explicitly granted it to do, and it should do them with great reluctance, and government should always try to be as small as possible and never to be large. And anything that can be done by private um, enterprise, like your water projects, that are done without government, they're done by voluntary associations of, of, of philanthropic people who love humanity, that's how it should be done. Whenever government gets involved, it becomes wasteful, regulatory, and not everyone in the country necessarily wants to support your water projects. And so government should do those things that we all agree are absolutely essential to be done collectively, and only if we have a constitution that enumerates those powers, and then they should be done with great hesitation and reluctance and with a minimum of removal of tax money from your pocket. That's my ideal of America. Of course, that has nothing to do with your America, in which government is involved in every possible aspect of your lives. Nobody could have anticipated this. I'm a strict constructionist. I believe that we should only do what the Constitution tells us we can do. If that were the case, almost your entire government would collapse in an instant. You know, what, how did you get a central intelligence agency? How did you get a national endowment for the sciences? You can go on at great length. If government only did what was empowered by the Constitution, government would do almost nothing. And frankly, that's the way it should be. And if you don't want to associate with me, you don't have to associate with me. And if I want to associate with somebody who's a Muslim or who is a, a homosexualist or who is a radical um, anarchist, I should have the right to those associations unless they break out into antisocial action. I believe in a maximum of personal freedom for each one of you to determine who you are, how you want to live, what you want to worship, whom you, with whom you want to associate. The fewer controls on your life, the better your republic. Don't you agree? Yes. Yeah. So why did you let this happen? <laughs> I mean, think of it. If you agree with me, I mean, here's my goal. Let's say there are 100 people in this room tonight. Just take a minute and look around for a second. Yeah, let's say this is the republic. Here's what I wanted. I wanted each one of you to be a fully responsible, self-reliant, self-actualized human being. If that were the case, 
we'd have no welfare system because we would only need a welfare system for the for people who were having a really rough time for some reason or other or who were born with a disability or you know you can imagine situations where any any decent society will take care of some especially needy people don't you mm -hmm. yeah. but we wouldn't have any routine system because everyone who could be self-reliant would be self-reliant our educational system would bring everyone up to their capacities and everyone would obey the law because it's in our interest to obey the law everyone would be feeding himself and clothing himself and sheltering himself and living with absolute freedom. And then any associations we had with others would be voluntary, but there wouldn't be social hierarchies, there wouldn't be dependencies. Everyone would be capable of being a completely self-reliant, self-governing person. That's the ideal. Don't you all agree in some sense that's the ideal? No. So it's easier to do that when you're a farmer's nation like mine than when you're in a an urban industrial nation like yours. In other words, it's easier to talk that way in Monticello than it is in Seattle or in New York or in Boston. City, I didn't like cities. I don't think we should have cities. Uh, you, can't just, you can't outlaw them, but any rational being would not live in a city, in my view. You know, cities in my time were, were sources of disease. You know, uh, epidemics would sweep through cities. Our medicine was, was extremely primitive. So imagine if, if everyone in America, let's just imagine everyone you know were self-governing, self-actualized, self-reliant. Just imagine this for a moment. What kind of a country this would be? That's the ideal. You've strayed. <laughs> and if you've strayed, that doesn't mean you have to just shrug and accept that. You need to find mechanisms of renaissance. And what are those? the number one mechanism of, of a cultural and political and economic renaissance is education. I said to George with my mentor, enlighten the people generally, and every form of tyranny, both the body and mind, will disappear like the fog when the sun rises in the morning. And I said, if you expect to be a nation ignorant and free, you expect what never has been, and never can be in the history of civilization. And may I say, as someone looking at you from the past, you now appear to be testing that principle. <laughs> if you expect to be a nation ignorant and free, you expect what never has been and never can be in the history of civilization. Public education is almost the universal elixir to solve the problems of a society. We believed in that principle. You have 13 years of public education. Just what you're doing during those 13 years is hard for me to fathom, <laughs> given the results. That's a long time. I thought in three years we could have universal literacy and numeracy. 13 years? I don't know what you're doing. Because as I look from 200 years in the past at your body politic, it does not appear to be especially informed or enlightened. <laughs> Another question in the back. But let's go ahead over here. Yes? I'm going to be visiting Monticello next month. What should I be seeing, or what can you tell us about it? You're visiting Monticello? Yeah. I didn't realize they'd opened it up for the public. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very private kind of man. Um, well, go to the gardens. The gardens are spectacular. Uh, you know, we had to feed ourselves. There were no grocery stores. So we had to flood our own lambs and milk our own cows and churn our own butter and so on. And the gardens are huge. They're uh, 900 feet in length. It's a terrace that I had built against the, the south side of the mountain. And I was a very experimental gardener. So I hope you'll take the garden tour it's a really interesting thing. And you'll see the sheer variety of things that I attempted to grow. It was not just a vegetable garden, it was an experimental garden. I had seeds from the Lewis and Clark expedition and seeds from all over the world, and sort of like an agricultural experiment station. As to the rest, uh, you, there are docents, I'm told, they'll take you through the house. In the entryway is a, is a museum, and I really urge you to linger there if you can. There are artifacts from the Lewis and Clark expedition in there. There are maps of South America. There are mastodon and mammoth bones. I was fascinated by them. Uh, 
it's a set of curiosities. It's sort of a small private museum, and I think it's worth lingering there if you can. They will talk to you about slavery in a very candid way. I hope that when you get there, you have to buy a ticket. Mr. Hamilton has taken over, but <laughs> and it's an expensive ticket too. But when you get there, I hope you won't take the courtesy bus up to the gate. You should walk up the path because that you'll get a sense of what it was like coming to Monticello at my time. I built my house on a mountain, and it was regarded as a really odd thing to do because, of course, it's so steep. And so people who would come would have to go through this forest. It was like going into the wilderness for them. And, and they thought, what kind of a civilized man lives in the wilderness on top of a mountain? And so it, I think walking up is the right thing to do. It's Palladian. And so you'll see echoes of Andrea Palladio's neoclassicism. And actually, it's, optic, it's also an optical illusion. I make three floors look like one. All of the dependencies, the wine cellar in the kitchen and the root cellars and the ice house and the slave quarters are hidden uh, so that you don't actually see them as you come up from the east side. The house faces west into the future of this country. I'll just give for everyone else just a quick sense of a couple of things you might look at. When you come into the main hall, this Indian museum, there's a calendar clock. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Monticello, but there's a clock that not only tells the time of the day, but also the day of the week. Now that might not seem so interesting in your time, but it was almost a technological miracle in my time. Here's how it worked. There was a clock face like any other clock face, but out of it came two chains, and those chains went to the corner of the room and over pulleys and then down to the floor. And so you, one of them was the one that turned the mechanism of the clock, and every Monday I would climb up a ladder I designed and, and, and bring that up to the top. And so it was like a grandfather clock in that regard. And then over on the other side, the days of the week were pasted, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so on. And there were cannonballs, and they would go from Monday to Tuesday and Tuesday to Wednesday. So you looked up to the base of the clock to see the time of the day, and then over at the corner of the room to see the day of the week. Think of how ingenious this is. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> but I made a mistake, a design mistake. And when you get to the parquet floor, which I designed, it was only Friday. <laughs> and so now I'm stuck, and so I didn't want to redesign the clock, and so I had holes drilled in the floor, and the cannonballs go down into the basement where Saturday and Sunday are placed in there. And so it's a little disorienting, but, but that you can see, and, that, and they, it still operates in your time. And then when you go into my dining room, you'll see my wine dump waiters, and in the sides of the, of the fireplace, uh, there are hidden doors and you open them up and, and there's a little pulley and you can pull bottles of wine up from the cellar into the dining room. So, you know, this is of no social utility, but, but people really liked it. It's sort of a form of, I want, I was, a, as you perhaps have gotten a sense, I was an eccentric. And, and, I, like, and I had a whimsical side to me and so I liked this sort of thing. And so you'll, you'll see all of, of that at Monticello, but, if, but if, if you really want to get the effect, go out into the fields and in, into the garden. Take just a couple quick more, yes. What do you think of being on the, um... <laughs> being on the what? Mount Rushmore. Oh, I'm, well, I thought you were going to say nickel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought you were going to say two dollar bill, <laughs> and then you said Mount Rushmore. <laughs> um, I was never in South Dakota. I th when I started talking tonight, I talked about how I never really took myself too seriously. The idea that you would carve my face on a mountain, I find upsetting. <laughs> because I think, and I'll tell you why, I think that's to make us seem more powerful and interesting than we were. So I get, George Washington's there. I'm there, and then the 16th president, and then the 26th president. I didn't live to see either of them. But if you do this, if you put us on coinage and on currency and create these monuments to us and carve us on mountains in the Dakotas, you're effectively making us demigods. We don't deserve that. We were men like other men. We had strengths and weaknesses, and we had good days and bad days, and terrible prejudices, and occasionally great insights. This is a democracy. You know, the, my theme tonight was the crucible of democracy. If it's a democracy, then each one of you is equal to everyone else. Each one of you has the worthiness, the
capacity. We shouldn't create a hierarchy of semi-divine figures from the past. And when you do that, you effectively disable yourself from the revolutionary agenda of your own time. You need to realize you're as important as George Washington if you choose to use your mind and your character to push for a, a better world. And so I'm, I just don't think that I, it's good to do this. I, I think you should put on your coinage bison <laughs> and grizzly bears and woolly mammoths and pronghorn antelopes and certainly not the beaver. <laughs> that era is over now. But the bison or the bighorn sheep I just, I'm, I never like the idea of aggrandizing the Founding Fathers or aggrandizing any one of us in this way. I think that it effectively eliminates your own sense of your own possibility as a, as a full, equal citizen of this republic. And as long, as long as I'm on this subject, let me say I'm not in favor of paper currency anyway, because paper currency can be manipulated by the Hamiltonians. <laughs> you know, think of it. Paper currency is printed. And so what's the difference between a $100 bill and a $10 bill or a $1 bill? Mm -hmm. It's just ink. And that those, those monies have only the value that ascribed to them. Whereas a coin out of gold or silver has intrinsic value anywhere on earth. But paper currency can be manipulated by the manipulators. And believe me, they exist. And they exist to aggrandize themselves at your expense. They, they manipulate the currencies for their own purposes without any actual interest in the actual people of the United States. And so I'm for a barter economy if we can get it, but if we have to have coinage, it should be on metal. Because if, if this country collapsed, you could take a gold coin to France and use it. But if this country collapsed and you took a $10 bill to France, that's just paper. Yes, you asked, uh make a good point about one person, one vote. I know that was a big point of the operation of democracy. When you asked also where we went astray, I would suggest one place was where when the Supreme Court or others made corporations have the rights of the citizen, of the individual. And it almost does it not render it one dollar, one vote. The question is about the court's decisions to make corporations persons. Um, I, I, I can't be um, blamed for that. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't live to see that, and I wouldn't have been in favor of it. We were, we were just a proto-capitalist country in my time. We were just, we, we didn't have corporations. Everything was very modest and basic in my time. When I, when I was born in Virginia, there was one bank in the United States. When I died, there were 330. I'm not friendly to banks. Certainly wouldn't be for a Federal Reserve. These things all happen, and they're part of the emerging dynamics of American life, and they're really beyond politics in many respects, and they're certainly beyond my understanding. I died personally helplessly in debt. Uh, I, should, I guess I should say a word about the Supreme Court. Um, and then I'll take one last question, and then we'll, I want to break character, but let me say a word about the Supreme Court. The fact that the court could make this decision offends me. And it's not about the decision per se, it's that they can make decisions. But if you read the Constitution, the, the Constitution does not empower the courts to, for judicial review. The, the, there's nothing in the Constitution that can be construed as giving the courts the right to strike down legislation. You know, every year you wait for the court to say, this is unconstitutional, we're striking down this or that provision of this law, or a whole law. That was never intended. Read your constitution. There is no reference to judicial review. That, that idea that the court of nine people can sit in splendid isolation and overturn the will of a third of a billion people, that idea was imposed upon the constitution by my cousin John Marshall, <laughs> that gloomy malignity. <laughs> he was for 34 years the chief justice of the Supreme Court. He wanted a strong central national government and he twistified his rulings during that period and browbeat the other justices to create a centralized American Republic rather than the decentralized state-based confederacy that the Constitution intended. We talked about the Second Amendment. Let me remind me of the 10th. The 10th says those powers not delegated to the national government belong instead to the states and to the people. 
That's the 10th amendment that says that the power is not specifically enumerated to the national government, belong instead to the states and to the people at large. Imagine how different the country would be if you were governed by that 10th amendment. And so along comes Marshall, and he, in the case Marbury v. Madison in 1803, he traveled out of the case and he declared a piece of the 1789 Judiciary Act unconstitutional. And he said in his famous ruling in Marbury v. Madison that the Supreme Court has the right to strike down what it takes to be unconstitutional legislation. I disagree. Of the three branches of government, the one that is supreme is the legislative. The president is the only national officer, but he, but he should not be a monarch. He's really subordinate to the legislature. The legislature is the branch closest to you, closest to the will of the people. And so we should have legislative supremacy. The executive should ex execute laws, propose laws, but it can't create law on its own, and it should be subordinate to the legislative branch, and the Senate should be subordinate to the House because that's the body that actually is elected by you, not indirectly. And the court should have an advisory function. So let's say that uh, the, Congress of the, United States, Congress of the United States passes a law that, that censors the newspapers. The court should say, in our opinion, this violates the First Amendment. We urge you to rethink it. But if the court can strike that down, then the court can strike anything down, and there's no recourse. There has never been a successful impeachment of a Supreme Court justice in all of American history. Think of that. And once they're appointed, they serve for life, and as I put it during my first term, few die and none resign. <laughs> in my time, if you appointed somebody in his 40s, he might live to be 50. In your time, if you appoint somebody in their 40s, they could live to be 100. This can't be right that nine unelected, unaccountable, unimpeachable people can sit in splendid isolation and rule for a third of a billion people. Anti-democratic, anti-republican, and not in the Constitution of the United States. And so you just made me grumpy now <laughs> by bringing this up because this was not the principle. You get the last word now. Okay. So I want to talk about romantic love, and I wanted to know if, when you got to be an old man and you look back on your life, what woman would appear most in your mind? Out of my blush. <laughs> really? You want me to talk about this? I won't ask you about your love life. <laughs> my goodness, I would, I would have fainted dead away had this been question, question been asked of me in my lifetime. Um, I will try to answer it. I was in love a couple of times, not worth going into as an adolescent, you know, how irrational and foolish all that is. In 1770, I met a woman named Martha Wales Skelton, who was a widow. Her husband had recently died. She had one child. I fell in love with her. I courted her at her plantation, The Forest. Music was one of the things that brought us together. We were married on the first day of January, 1772. She lived for 10 more years. She died at the age of 34 of complications from birthing her sixth child. Four of her six children died in infancy. So we knew loss in the most, in the deepest possible way. And then she died on September 6, 1782 of complications from birthing her last child. We, I later said we had 10 years of uncheckered happiness. She was the, the love of my life and in some sense the only love of my life. When she died, I had a nervous breakdown, you'd call it. And it wasn't clear that I would survive. I actually wrote to my sister-in-law and said I would maybe consider suicide if it weren't for my surviving children. Nothing in my life was ever as hard as that. On her deathbed, she called in me and our children and some trusted slaves, household servants, and she asked me never to remarry because she had been the victim of a stepmother, didn't want her children to have a stepmother, and so I hearkened to that and never did remarry, and whether there was a mistress, that's another question, but 
It took me a long time to recover from that. It was Mr. Madison who saved my life. So Mr. Madison, my closest friend, realized that I was not going to recover at Monticello. And so he convinced Congress to send me to Europe as an ambassador. And he thought that that would get me out from under the scenes of my acute grief, and it did. It changed my life in one moment. And I, as I say, I never remarried. I had then to be both father and mother to my surviving children. I was kind of a self-sufficient human being. I, I could do almost anything pretty well. I was an interior decorator and a cook, and so I didn't really need a helpmate, sort of a woman. And then I hearkened to my wife's request that I not remarry. I did fall in love one more time, sort of. In Europe, I met a woman named Maria Cosway, who was in some ways the most remarkable woman I ever met. She was an artist and a musician and a linguist and extraordinarily beautiful. Uh, I, might have, I might have broken my vow never to remarry, but for two things. One is that she was a Roman Catholic, and given my deism and Unitarianism, that might have been difficult. And secondly, she was already married. <laughs> <laughs> and even though it was a marriage of mere convenience, I didn't think that that would really work well back in this country. And so I kept it platonic and slowly you know, pulled away over, over time. But she was certainly a very deep temptation. And then I'll just close with this, and then, and then we'll have just this tiny little last segment here. But you know, John Adams and I were best friends in some regards, certainly dear friends, and we were two of the creators of the Declaration of Independence, and we were in Europe together. And he's the one who got me the assignment for the Declaration of Independence, but then we began to diverge, and we diverged over the human nature, and we diverged over the French Revolution particularly, and, they, and then eventually I just placed him as president. He wanted to serve at least two terms, and maybe many more, and when I replaced him after one term, he took it personally. And he actually created the greatest snub in transition history because he didn't even stay in Washington to see me inaugurated in this place. He left on the dawn stage on the day of my inaugural. And I took that very personally because not only was it ungentlemanly, and I think you all agree that a president must behave always in a very gentlemanly and <laughs> civil way. <laughs> nice. That, that a president who doesn't show dignity, deportment, civility, respect, tolerance, is unfit for that office. Yes. I, I speak only of my own time. Uh, but it was also wrong publicly that in a republic like ours, when there's a transition, the outgoing president needs to be there to show continuity and, and respect. And so we never saw each other again. He left on the 4th of March, 18-1, on the dawn stage. I never saw him again. We would have died unreconciled, but. If, Mutual friend Benjamin Rush brought us back together by writing to each one of us in 1812 saying the other one was ready for reconciliation. <laughs> and John Adams broke the long silence and then you know, we, we warmed up into a very interesting correspondence. Some historians have said that the 144 letters we exchanged are among the greatest in American history. I leave that um, to you to determine, but in, in one of his letters in 1816 or so, Mr. Adams said to me, I'm going to put the most whimsical and strange question that's ever been put to you, Mr. Jefferson. He said, would you agree to live your life over again? And I thought about this, and you should think about this. Would you agree to live your life over again? Especially you who are in advanced age. And I wrote back and I said, yes, I would. I would live my life over again. In fact, I would live my life over and over and over again, as many times as the Creator offered it to me, because I'm an optimist. I steer my boat with hope ahead and fear astern. And life is more pleasurable than not. And all of us have blows and setbacks and losses and grief. But on the whole, life, I think, is, is an extraordinary experiment. And of course, I would do it over again. But I said, with, this, with these two conditions, I said I would not live again from 1 to 25. No rational being would ever do that. <laughs> and I said I would not want to live after my body began to show signs of serious deterioration or my mind.
but from 20 or 25 to 70, or maybe even a little higher, yes. I would live my life as many times as I had the chance. But I said, but I want to ask you a question, John Adams. I can accept all of the, all of the economy of life, all of the vicissitudes and the, and the aging process and everything. I can accept the whole equation of human life. But I want to ask you, what is the use of grief? What is the use of grief? I said, I have lost everything that I love. My wife at 33, four of my six children, the fifth during my presidency. My best friend died when he was 34. My favorite sister died when she was 26. I said, I, have, I was born to lose everything that I love and I can accept life and I admire life and I believe in life, but I cannot accept the use of grief. What is the use of grief? And so John Adams wrote back, you can read this correspondence for yourself, and he said, well, grief prepares us for the inevitability of death. Uh, grief teaches us the principles of non-attachment. Uh, grief humbles us so we turn to God for solace uh, and other Calvinist nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> other Calvinist nonsense. <laughs> So that's, that's my answer to you, that I loved deeply, profoundly, monogamously, and never got over it in some sense, and then moved in, turned in, became this kind of achievement machine that you see before you, rather than a person who really lived a, a full life. Well, here's what I'm going to do. It's growing late. I'm going to take off my little wig here. Um, and I want to speak for just four minutes out of character. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting me here. I love coming here. I love evenings like this. These are my favorite evenings where I don't know what you're going to ask. Sorry you did. <laughs> um, you know, you Sally Hemings, oh, yeah, almost certainly. We're not, it wouldn't pass in a court of law, but almost certainly the DNA looks convincing. And, the circumstantial evidence, and it's a long and complicated story. I'd love to talk further, but but yes, Jefferson didn't ever remarry, but he found some, some sort of decades-long solace with Sally Hemings, who was three-quarters white, half-sister of his wife, um, could pass as white. She could pass in the white world, and Jefferson seems to have, I mean, if, you, if they had a 34-year relationship, it had to have some mutual satisfactions, I would think. But we don't know the first thing about it. He never wrote about it, never talked about it. There's an utter silence on Jefferson's part about this question. So we just don't know. Some people say he was a slave rapist. That doesn't seem to be right. Other people say it's a star-crossed love affair, you know, impossible love across racial lines. That doesn't seem right. We just don't know. I mean, we literally can't say what this was, but it, it does appear that it, it was. I love coming here, and I, I want to say so much. I so much believe in friendly water. You all do, too. But what, a, what an extraordinary idea that there is a non-government, inexpensive thing that we can do to fix the world in a real way. Amazing. I've bought several of these items. from. You should buy them. I give them away as Christmas gifts. And it, it just is one of those things that just makes you glad when you see it, when you realize that this simple device that doesn't take a team of experts or high technology or a power grid or a government grant can come in and do something really extraordinary that literally changes the lives of people. When I've heard about this, and you've heard about it too, I won't go into details, but when I've heard about this, I think, okay, that makes sense, you know, fresh water. It's easy for me to say, having had access to only the best things that life can offer for all of my life, you know, what, what, I, what really brought me around into deep reverence for what David and all of you are doing is when I heard that when this happens, it not only keeps people alive, which is, of course, the fundamental thing, but then they start to regroup as, as in the community. They start to do things. People work. They come together. They form association. The community creates a new vibrancy because of this. It's not just about the quality of the water. It's what it does for a community that's no longer debilitated all the time. And then things can happen. You know, the kind of self-reliance that we're talking about in a, in a kind of a new flowering. So the, crime rates go down and the molestations go down and the family violence goes down and 
everything gets a little better. When the, we should keep this in mind as we think about places like Puerto Rico, that when the people have to have a basic sufficiency or nothing else can happen, right? People have to have a basic sufficiency or nothing else can happen. And so I don't know why we can't ever figure this out. It's such an obvious thing, but it is. And so I just love what you're doing and I really support it and we'll come back any old time. Um, and, and I want to do more. I just want to say two or three other things. First of all, I'm from North Dakota. Um, so, so coming here is just like coming to Mecca. <laughs> I, had, I had Thai food yesterday. <laughs> uh, we don't do that in North Dakota. We're, we're the land of Velveeta out there. <laughs> it's, uh, you have great cuisine here. And, um, I love rain. I know you not so much, but um, we don't get rain out where I am. In fact, we've had a prolonged drought. And this part of the world, one of my favorite people in the world, David McCandry, lives here, and formerly of the Washington State Historical Society, a great author, new book coming out on Captain James Cook and um, Ron Story and all of the Friendly Waters people and other friends from Seattle, some of whom are here tonight. I just love coming here. You know, I, where it rains, people read. <laughs> And you're the last true readers, I think, in this country. There's a reason why the coffee culture started in Seattle. You know, the reading, book clubs, reading rooms, coffee, caffeine. Um, it shows, you know. I, it's fun to come to a blue place from time to time. Because I live in the land of Glenn Beck. Nothing wrong with that, but you don't want it every day. You know, you just want a little variety. And so you're out here, super enlightened. Um, well read, Thai food. <laughs> I saw in Starbucks this morning there was a ukulele festival going on tonight in the week. I'm sure the ukulele is regarded as a communist plot in North Dakota. <laughs> uh, you know, we don't have anybody. We have Lewis and Park and we have Lawrence Well. <laughs> That's it. So um, I don't think the ukulele has ever been played within the boundaries of North Dakota. Um, I want to thank KOWA. It's the only public radio station in the state of Washington that carries the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We, that's thrilling to me. And I want to urge you, before you go, we can, we can talk privately, but I want to urge you to pick up one of these brochures and consider coming on one of our cultural tours. Some survivors are here tonight, but every summer we go on the Lewis and Clark Trail and it's like the greatest trip ever. Uh, but also, I do two January retreats at a lodge just west of Missoula. One this year is on Walden, my favorite book. We talk about the challenge that Thoreau has for all of our lives. It's amazing, and we're also going to talk in that same um, retreat about Desert Solitaire by Edward Abbey, who's sort of a 20th century Thoreauian. And then the other one's on Shakespeare, and I just wanted to linger on that for one second. I've been doing this new program on Shakespeare. I don't pretend to be Shakespeare, but I... I do a one-man Shakespeare show. I'd love to come and do it here. I recite and you know talk about Hamlet and Shakespeare and fun facts and anecdotes and it's 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 one of the one of the most satisfying things I've ever done. I was trained as a Renaissance scholar. I'm just kind of slumming it in history here. And so I'm doing this Shakespeare thing and it's just thrilling. But one of the two retreats this winter at this lodge is one of the most beautiful lodges you can imagine. And it's on Shakespeare, so we're going to look at six or seven plays and films and an act of passage and so on. So if you want to come on any of those, and also John Steinbeck, we're going to Steinbeck's California in March for the second time. And it was just an incredibly rich experience last year, the first time we did it. So all of that, you can get this brochure, um, and, I, and I hope that you will um, consider doing that. If you're interested in the Thomas Jefferson Hour, um, you can get it on podcast, so you don't have to be close to any radio station, but KWA does, does carry it here. And then we have a 1776 club and so on and so forth. If you're interested in reading more about Shakespeare, or about Jefferson, the book that I would recommend most is by Joseph Ellis, and it's called American Sphinx, the character of Thomas Jefferson. It's the best single volume, I think, of our time on Jefferson, but there's a new one by John Bowles of Rice University. It's an outstanding one volume. So if you come up and talk to me privately, I can give you the names of those books. But I just want to thank you, and I want to say bye and support this project, Friendly Water for the World. Thank you very much.